Thank you very much for, to all of you for being here. Thanks a lot to the organizers for organizing this very nice meeting. It's a pleasure to, to be here. It's, um, I was chatting with some people this morning and yesterday, and this might be the most on topic talk of the whole conference because there are going to be networks, random networks sometimes. <laughs> random walks are in the title, and the spectrum will also show up eventually. So. Right, so, okay, the, the, these are just fancy pictures, I guess, but uh, um, there are people out there, not us, but you know, people who are practically minded, who worry about developing algorithms for extremely large networks, like you know, Facebook, or this is the, the, the physical internet. I mean, these pictures are old, and actually, if you look at the current versions, they're, they're kind of ugly, because they're so dense that you can't really see much. Right, this, this is very nice, but it's from 2005. The 2018 version is messy and a lot less pretty than this one. So people, we have these massive networks and we want to do things with them. I mean, even simple things like saying, you know, suppose someone gives you access to Facebook servers and you want to count the number of users, right? What are you going to do, download the entire graph to your notebook or, I mean, that's not going to work, right? So, <clears throat> and we're going to be looking then at Random walk based algorithms, algorithms that use perhaps several random walks on the same graph to say things about the graph and estimate the number of vertices or number of edges and the mixing time, those are going to be the three parameters we're looking at. And there are perhaps two reasons to use random walks. One of them is that they are already used by these practically minded people. So it's people actually write papers about how to implement random walks in distributed systems or large networks. And of course, we know a lot mathematically about random walks, so maybe we can expect to get sharp results in the problems they're going to be looking at, right? So we can maybe look at, and we're going to be saying a few things about the optimal time complexity of figuring out a good estimate for the number of vertices in the graph with high probability. So, and, and the, but perhaps, I mean, you know, there, there's kind of the, the corporate motivation for doing these things, right? The practical motivation, but for maybe for a mathematician, this is nicer, right? So it's basically the question that got us thinking is that you're doing this local process in a graph, right? And perhaps a few local processes, a few random walks. And how do you extrapolate information from that little knowledge you have the gra of the graph along the random walks to say something about the entire network? Is that even possible? Right, that's, uh, is, I mean, it's certainly the most interesting case is when you're able to do it and before you've had time to visit a positive proportion of the vertices, right? Otherwise it gets a bit simpler. But of course, when you put the problem like this, it's not clear what you can do. Uh, what we're gonna see, we can estimate these things with nearly optimal time complexity, but uh, you have to bear with me so that I can explain in what sense we can estimate, right? So there. So, okay, let's just start with notation. I guess everybody here knows what a graph is, and n is always the number of vertices, m is the number of edges. The graphs are undirected, they no, have no self-loops. And I mean, this is more notation, you know, neighbor, degree, blah, blah, blah. And I'm gonna be looking always at lazy random walk for, for technical reasons. Well, okay, the technical reason has to do with the spectrum already. You want the spectrum to be non-negative. And lazy random walk is, is just, you know, this process where you stay put with probability a half and you move to a neighbor with probably one over twice a degree, right? Any neighbor has the same probability. And this is just, you know, fancy picture, so maybe, okay. And this is even more notation. So we're gonna be looking at several random walks, right? Indexed by, by this parameter i here. So each one of them is x sub t i. And this guy here is the degree of this vertex, right? So basically what we see about the red work is what, you know, the vertices that have been visited by the random walk and the degrees of those vertices. And, uh, and here just saying, I mean, I'm gonna use this to say I'm on graph G and all of my random walks start from point X. In principle, I could allow the random walks to start from different points, but it really doesn't make too much of a difference to the theory. 
and in this way we get slightly cleaner results. You could think that maybe, you know, okay, the, let me move on. Basically, we can think that this starting vertex is chosen by an adversary, and we want to do as well as possible given that restriction. So, okay, we're going to be estimating, think what's an estimator. Here, I'm basically assuming that uh, all graphs I look at have their vertex set in, uh, contained in natural numbers. So the input to an estimator is just a sequence of vertices and degrees seen along the way by the, by the k random walks. By up to a certain time capital T. And uh, given a family of graphs and say a parameter like the number of vertices of one of these graphs, I want to prove results of this kind, right? That for any graph in my family, there exists, an, there exists a number of random walks in a certain time, such that if I have at least as many random walks and I have at least that much time, then no matter where I start from, I, I'll get a good estimate for this parameter with uh, high probability, right? So this is saying that I estimate gamma of G up to a, a one plus or minus epsilon factor. And I mean, that, so the time complexity is just the total number of random walks, right? That you multiply the number of random walks by the time that you use. But uh, I mean, and this is sort of a funny definition because I'm saying that, I mean, this is not the way we usually do things perhaps because we're saying, okay, my time complexity is somehow dependent on the graph G, which I really don't know, right? So there, there's something odd about this. So it's saying, okay, I can prove that perhaps I, my time complexity square root of the number of vertices, but I don't know the number of vertices. Perhaps that's even the parameter I'm trying to compute. So it might sound like it's a bit funny, and, but bear with me. But okay, so just to make sure we understand, I mean intuitively, what we're doing is uh, we have these random walks walking in this labyrinth, right? That's a graph. And uh, at any given time, you can ask what's the best guess they have for, say, the number of vertices in the graph. And that we want this best guess to be right with k as small as possible and time as small as possible. Well, we want it to be right with high probability, right? But probability greater than a half, basically. And I, as I said, the, mo the, mo the most interesting case is when you have sublinear estimators, right? The, it's not clear that you can always get sublinear estimators, and we're going to see that, in fact, you cannot always do that. Here's another thing that's perhaps more subtle, right? So, one thing that would be really nice if you get these algorithms to work, but not, not only that, they work and they decide on their own when they've seen enough of the graph, right? So the random walks start walking around the labyrinth and uh, eventually they decide now we can stop and give you a good estimate of the size of the graph with high probability, right? That would be what I call a self-stop algorithm, an algorithm that has a stopping time at which you can make a good prediction or a good uh, estimate. And, uh, but as we're going to see, these algorithms don't really exist in uh, interesting contexts. So we have to settle for a, a weaker definition. So okay, so perhaps it's good to start with some examples so that we understand uh, what are the limitations of, uh, of this problem, right? So let's, let's assume that our family of graphs is just cycles, cycles a different number of vertices, right? And uh, how do you figure out the size of the cycle? Well, my claim is that for a long time when you walk on a cycle, you don't see anything but a line, right? We know that you need uh, n squared steps to just wrap around the cycle. So if you're walking, if you have random walks on two different cycles, I mean, let's say, okay, there is a slightly non-obvious fact, which is that if you start k random walks from the same vertex in your graph, uh, the time it takes for one of them to wrap around, it's still of order n squared. I mean, the total time, right? The total number of steps. And, uh, well, in some sense, you're better off just having one random walk trying to wrap around. Right, so, but, it, okay, so it takes a long time for these random walks to see, to notice, for instance, that the cycle is not the, line, the, the integers, right? So up to that time, you can couple random walks, say, on a cycle of size n and a cycle of size 2n, so that they see the same thing. Or perhaps to the labels of the vertices, but you can match these so that you can't really tell the, the graph apart. So okay, this is the first non-trivial theorem that we have in this model, it's slightly non-trivial perhaps. 
you have this family of cycles, your parameter is the number of vertices. So what this is saying is that for any, well, I mean, good estimator, this should be uh, just an estimator that works with probability greater than two thirds, right? Um, so you can say that either a total number of steps you need to find, you need for the cycle size n is greater than n squared with a, an absolute constant in front, or this holds for the cycle size 2n. Why such an either or statement? Because I guess my definition allows for an estimator that always outputs n or something like that, right? So, I j so basically this means that, well, among other things, it means that for any estimator to choose, there is gonna be an infinite sequence of values of n, or perhaps half of the integers of n are gonna be such that you need more than n squared steps to figure out the size. So you see, even though we have some our weak definition when you when you you don't have the self-stopping property, this property of stopping time, there's still um, intrinsic limitations to how well you can do things. All right. So now let's talk about the case of expanders. Right. So maybe people know what an expander is. It's just a graph where, for any subset of the vertices that contains a half, a less than half of everything, there's a positive proportion of edges going outside that subset. Right, so the graph is deregular in this case. And we know that typically uh, 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 n regular graph, oh, I'm sorry, a deregular graph on n vertices and expander with high probability. So let's look, okay, that's just to say, I mean, this parameter h sub g is a Chigo constant, it tells you exactly this, it's this bottleneck ratio. And uh, let's look then at a class of deregular graphs with h sub g greater than h. We're gonna see later that we have good estimators for this class. I mean, we can get estimators where this holds, which maybe should remind you of the birthday paradox or something like that. And, uh, but there are no self-stopping sublinear estimators for this class. Remember that self-stopping is an estimator that has a stopping time and says, okay, right now I can stop and make a good estimate of the size of the graph. Okay, so, why is there no sublinear self-stopping estimator? Assume that there is a, that there is such an estimator and that for a, that works for a certain value of C. And C I'm gonna think of as a constant, right? So with probably two thirds, uh, this guy walks on a, a, a small fraction of the vertices here and decides, well, I've seen enough of the graph to say that its size is, I don't know, C up to one plus or minus epsilon. Well, what you can do is you can always glue such a graph to a much, much larger graph. While keeping it as an expander, perhaps you're gonna, you're gonna lose something in the Chigge constant, perhaps. But if you make this, well, if this is a constant and this is some very large number, you can get things to work out. But then, clearly, if random walk or the K random walks don't have time to visit one of these vertices here, uh, they won't have time to figure out that perhaps you're in this much larger graph. And then it's clear that you have a problem, right? So if the random, walk, uh, the random walks decide in some linear time that they've seen enough, they might be stuck in here and not notice that there's a, a world out there, so to speak. So there are, there are limitations. I mean, you can make this, uh, you can make variants of this example where perhaps this, you can, maybe you say, I don't care about any constant number of vertices. Maybe I care about uh, kind of a, a growing sequence of values of C, and then maybe you can look you can get such an example with the Chigger constant being any function that goes slowly to zero, even if you allow this C to, to grow somehow. So yeah, so the complexity, so what we've learned, okay, from cycles we learned that we cannot get sublinear complexity in general. So we need some assumption on the graph to get sublinear complexity. And uh, there are families like expanders, as, for, as I'm going to see, there are sublinear algorithms for them but there are no self-stopping sublinear algorithms. And so we're gonna just decide to not look at self-stopping, though we do have a few results saying that perhaps if you know the number of edges, you can compute the mixing time by a self-stopping algorithm and vice versa. So okay, let me give you another lower bound, right? I gave a lower bound for cycles. Let me show you that, and this is very important for, for the rest of the talk. Let me show you that for expanders, there's a, there's a square root of n lower bound. So I claim that there's an upper bound of square root of n. I haven't shown you why that's true, but we'll get to that. And now, but now I'm gonna show you the lower bound. 
And uh, the lower bound is based on something we saw yesterday in uh, whose talk was it in? Uh, who? I mean, I, someone talked about the configuration model. I can't remember who it was. But uh, it's basically, so we, what we're going to do in order to prove the lower bound is to generate the random graph and the random walk, or the random walks, if you want, at the same time. So I'm, I'm going to pretend there's just one single random walk because it's easier to explain, but the same argument works for a k random walk started from the same vertex. And uh, we're going to generate the random graph and the random walk, and the random graph we generate by the configuration model, right? Which is a thing where you take, in this case, d half edges representing each vertex, and you take a random matching of the d half edges. And uh, but I mean, you can generate this matching sequentially, right? So you take one half edge. And you ask who this guy, who is this guy matched with, and you go there, and then you can you can any in, in any fashion if you query for who is the the, the guy that's matched with this guy, uh, you you get the same model, the same the same configuration model. So what we're going to do essentially is we're going to query just for the the guy. I mean, we have to jump somewhere. Random walk has to jump somewhere here, so it queries out who is the first neighbor of this guy, and then it sees something. And there are these, uh, yeah, then it goes back, perhaps. And then it goes somewhere else. So we query for another vertex. And then maybe go back. And then we go somewhere else. And we just keep revealing the graph little by little, right? Uh, well, we do it for a long time. And eventually, you're going to find a cycle. But how long does it take for you to find a cycle, right? So it takes you square root of n steps by some kind of birthday paradox kind of argument. What happens before then is that you can really couple this process on a random graph of size n with the similar process on a random graph of size 2n, and you won't be able to tell the difference between the two until the first cycle appears in a graph of size n. Or you could, say, you could say that before the first cycle appears, you don't know whether you're walking on, a, on an expander or on an infinite deregular tree. And it's, once you put it that way, it's sort of clear that you can't really tell, can't really say anything about the size of the graph before time squared of n. Uh, maybe I should mention, because I'm going to be talking about, the end of the talk, uh, about that in the end of the talk, is that this is in some sense a very general lower bound. So you can, you can have algorithms that are more general than ours that we call random walks or restarts, which are just, you have one random walk trajectory, but you can press a reset button at any time and send it back to the starting point. You can have any sort of growth model where you, you're growing the set of vertices that you, have seen, that you have seen by adding a vertex that's at the boundary of the current set. For any such model, you, you get this lower bound. I'm not being very precise here, but hopefully you get the idea. Right, so okay, now we have at least two lower bounds. And, uh, and let me perhaps jump ahead a little bit and say that all of our lower bounds are essentially going to be based on this expander example. But now we should say something about what we can do. I mean, the positive results, right? And um, well, I mean, so that's sort of an obvious sentence. We are going to use random walks. So we don't know exactly which graph we're walking on. So we need kind of general methods. OK, just to remind you of lazy random walk, I mean, that's just the uh, the transition matrix, right? Um, if the graph is regular, and I'm, I'm going to give some proof sketches for the for the regular case, that's just well, a JC matrix divided by the degree plus the identity and divide everything by two, right? So this is saying stay put with probability a half, take a step to a neighbor with probability a half. And uh, I mean, this is also kind of obvious, so maybe if you're almost embarrassed to say this in this audience, right? But we're going to, because we're going to be looking at higher powers of, of this guy, the spectrum is going to be useful. And it's nice to know that for lazy random walk, as I said, I mean, the important thing is that uh, the spectrum is no negative. So there are many things that work for lazy random walk for this reason that don't work for uh, if you allow uh, negative eigenvalues. Well, so you have a, maybe I should say, yeah, you have a, uh, a real spectrum, because this P is self-adjoint. Well, I mean, for if the graph is regular, it's really a symmetric matrix, so there's no question about it. And uh, it's a real non-negative spectrum because you're in a walk lazy. And uh, this parameter, which is called the relaxation time, is going to be very important for us. This is, uh, here, I'm only relating it to the Stieger constant that I introduced before, 
But uh, I mean, you don't need to think about this. It's just, let's keep this number in mind. And so what we're going to do is basically write upper bounds, I mean, positive results in terms of the relaxation time of the graph. It turns out that's a, a convenient quantity to look at. Well, there are going to be a few results that are not going to be about the relaxation time. They're going to use the fact that, you know, we know that as t goes to infinity, the probability of going to, from x to y in t steps converges to degree of y divided by twice the number of edges. And uh, we know that there's a time that's at most uh, the relaxation time times log n at which uh, this ratio is close to one. I mean, close to one means that it's off by a factor of at most of a, a quarter in either direction. So this is what we call the uniform mixing time. But for most things, we're gonna be talking about the relaxation time. And maybe I should mention before I continue that um, you know, we're gonna be talking about results that say, well, if the mixing, if the relaxation time is small enough, then you have sublinear algorithms, which are sort of our holy grail, so to speak. And uh, there is some degree of evidence that, you know, social networks in real life, they have polylog relaxation times or mixing times, uh, which means that maybe, you know, if I was talking to an audience of engineers, I could even claim that my results are useful for something. I have nothing against engineers, by the way. Some of my best friends are engineers. But, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let me tell you what we do in the case of regular graphs. And then we, um, and it, he, this case is nice because there's, um, I already mentioned the birthday paradox and you see the square root of n bound for expanders, which seems related. So we're gonna see that there's an idea that several groups have tried, which is looking at random walk collisions and trying to use those to, to figure out the size of the graph. And that's really similar to the birthday paradox. But uh, we're gonna see that uh, what we use, uh, which are random walk intersections, are more efficient somehow. Okay, so we have this, uh, that, that if you run the random walk for more than t unit steps, then if the graph is regular, right, the stationary distribution that I showed you is uniform. So if you run the random walk for long enough, you have one uniform sample from the graph. If you run several uh, random walks, Loosely speaking, you have a, a, an IID sample of uniform vertices of the graph. So this is the idea that people have tried. They've looked, I mean, they take their k random walks and they look at how many collisions they see at a time t. Assuming that t is large enough, you expect that this is like, well, k squared divided by, by n, right? An expectation, that's what it, uh, that's its value. So here I should have said that i and j are different, otherwise you get something silly. But uh, yeah, so what happens is that, okay, if you take t to be larger than uniform mixing time, if you take a k that's larger than square root of n, then the expectation of this random variable is k squared over n, and the variance is less than the expectation squared. So what? Well, I mean, this means that if, uh, if you do things in the right way, you can basically get um, just by looking at this random variable, right? So if k is greater than square root of n, and if t is larger than uniform mixing time, if you look at this ratio of k squared to the, uh, to the number of collisions, well, this is typically close to k squared divided by k squared divided by n, which is n. So great, that's an estimator for the number of vertices. And the number of random walk steps that you need is this, right? So you need, uh, a number of random walks that's like square root of n at least, and you need a time that's like the uniform mixing time at least. But then we can look at our two examples and we see, okay, for expanders, that gives you the right result, right? Because the, well, almost, up to a log factor, right? So we have a lower bound that's square root of n, and the upper bound, well, the uniform mixing time is log n, square root of the number of vertices that's here, so that roughly matches. But for cycles, this is way off. So, but just to mention, right, so there, there are many papers about this idea. There are also papers by Laurent Massouillet and others uh, where they generalize these ideas to non-regular graphs. And uh, our main, in some sense, our uh, one other motivation that we had is that, well, can you make better use of random walks and try to figure out the size of, figure out the, size of the graph uh, if you don't look only at collisions, but you look at more information somehow? 
of course, more information could be anything, right? So it's better to have uh, a concrete thing in mind. And we're going to be looking at intersection counts. So, so now capital K is twice some small k. We're going to be looking at pairs of random walks. They're all independent, and maybe, I mean, it's, we're going to be thinking they, they start from the same vertex. And, uh, and for each pair, you're going to count the number of times the two paths intersect up to time t, right? And an intersection, by definition, is just a pair of times S1, S2, where random walk, this random walk is at the same place as this random walk, right? This random walk at time S1 is at the same place as this random walk at time S2. And to get the intersection count, well, we're going to take an average just because we're taking a sum of little k values. Okay, what can we say about this random variable? For um, well, there, there there was a previous paper by Yuval, Thomas Alvald, Perla Susi, and Alexander Stauffer, where they proved some results on this random variable, these random variables, in the case of uh, transitive graphs. But it turns out and uh, it turns out that you can prove this more generally for regular graphs, and you can even prove the bounds a little bit in that degree of generality. So what you can prove, okay, assuming everybody starts from the same vertex. So, okay, if you count collisions for stationarity, right, at any time you have two, if you have two random walks that are stationary, they probably they intersect at those, not at any time, sorry, at any pair of times S1, S2, the probably they're equal with T squared, is, sorry, is one over N. And because we're counting a number t squared of steps in total, then you have t squared of n is the expectation uh, when you start from stationarity. And this is always a lower bound for reasons we're going to see if everybody starts from the same vertex. But then you have an upper bound that's the same term plus this mysterious quantity, which I'm going to try to explain. And you see that the variance is at most the expectation squared up to a constant factor. Well, this is the worst case, but I mean, if you take t large enough so that this is larger than this, then really everything sort of matches. Okay, what do you get from this? So again, as I said, you want to take t to be large enough so that this term dominates the other term. And that, what does this lead you to? Oh, sorry, that's, I'm not sure, yeah, I had a PowerPoint version which wasn't working properly, it had an animation, so let me perhaps write down I want t squared to, over n to be greater than constant t rel. Well, let me raise the constants. And so that's the same as saying that I need t to be greater than square root of n t rel raised to 3 quarters. So the theorem is saying that if I take t to be large enough, and I also need to choose k, the number of random walks, right? So the number of random walks is only going to, to depend on this parameter epsilon that I have here for the bounds. If I take these two things, then I can say that, well, okay, that I have the expectation of intersections is uh, one plus or minus epsilon t squared over n, and that the variance, remember that this i sub, uh, I sub t is an average, right? And the variance is going to be like the expectation squared divided by k. And then if I do things right, I can prove with that we're probably greater than two-thirds. The ratio of t squared to this random variable is going to be close to n. And so that's our first kind of real result in some sense. So that's saying that this if you look at the total complexity, right, so think of epsilon as a small constant, then the total complexity is dictated by these two guys, and really the constant doesn't matter, so you get this. In particular, if the relaxation time is less than some power of n, which is, what is it? I don't know, anyway. If it's less than some power of n, you get sublinear. And let's compare this idea to the collisions idea. Which, so it's saying that, um, that uh, you have, okay, for collisions, you need uh, the number of steps per random walk is a uniform mixing time. So you, you have a number of steps that's usually larger for intersections, right? Each random walk walks for longer. Uh, the number of walkers for collisions is larger 
but the number of intersec for intersections is a constant for any fixed epsilon. What's the total number of steps? Well, here you get square root of n t unif, here you get t, uh, square root of n t rel to the three quarters, which is better, right? Because uh, t rel is a lower bound for t unif, essentially, so this is better. And uh, if we look at the two examples we had, so it turns out the intersections give you the right order of magnitude. So it just, well, for cycles of relaxation times n squared, and you plug it in there, you get n squared. For expanders, uh, you know, collisions were already good, this is also good. But a more interesting question, I mean, since we write bounds in terms of relaxation time, we should say, have a lower bound that says something to the effect of, for any value of relaxation time, or for any growing function of n, if your relaxation times at most that function, right, so if that's the family of graphs that you have, can you prove a lower bound that matches this? So I don't want things just for cycles or expanders. I want things that are in between in terms of the relaxation time. And here's how you build this, these lower bounds. So I take an expander. That's the, those are the stars here. Um, when the expander has A or 2A vertices, right? So we know that if we only had the expander, it would take us time square root of A to distinguish between the two. Right, that's the lower bound that I showed before. But now you want to get a larger graph. So what you do, basically what you're doing here is you're subdividing each vertex, uh, each edge, sorry, into a path of a certain length k. But you want to keep the graph 3 regular. So you add a few edges like, uh, well, you take a k that's, uh, okay, so it's really turn, you're adding k vertices on each edge of the original graph. And then you connect guys at distance 2 so that you still have a 3 regular graph. So maybe you need k to be a multiple of 4 for this to work, but that's not a big issue. Okay, and then you ask, okay, what's the number of vertices? Well, that's clear, right, because you have a vertices, a edges, and uh, of the order of a edges anyway. And then basically what you get is a times k. And uh, I mean, if you look at it carefully, you get, you know, different numbers depending on whether you have a or 2a, but that's the order of magnitude. What's the relaxation time? Well, we know the random walk um, takes on, on average k squared steps to cross such a path. Right? So basically, random walk on this new graph is random walk on the expander slowed down by a factor of k squared. And you fork out the details and you can get a bound for relaxation time that's like k squared. And then you can ask yourself, what's the time I need to distinguish between these two graphs, right? So for expander, it was square root of number of vertices. Here, it's really like uh, random walk in the expander, slowed down by the fact that it takes you k squared steps on average to move from one vertex of the expander to another. So I can, and you can show that then you take at least k squared times square root of a steps to figure out the size of the graph. And then you can look at this, well this exactly matches, so I, right, you can put a k inside, so you get k to the three halves square root of number of vertices k to the 3 halves is really relaxation time raised to 3 quarters. So it's nice in a sense surprising that this exactly nails the, the complexity up to constants. Maybe I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time, let's see how much time I have. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time showing you the, how you prove this, and then in the non-regular case, I'm not gonna give proofs, I'm just gonna give you ideas, I mean, basically how you build the, the lower bounds. I mean, and the reason is really to, you know, I've already bragged about the fact that my talk is the most on topic one in the entire conference, and now I need to show you why, right? Right, so I'm just gonna show you, I mean, I claim this, these upper and lower bounds for the, the expectation of the number of intersections between two independent random walks started from the same vertex x, right? How do I compute this expectation, and then how do I find the bounds, right? Well, computing the expectation in terms of the transition matrix is really an exercise in elementary Markov chain theory. And here it is, right? I want the two random walks to meet. Well, I mean, at this one at time s2 to be at the same place as the one at time s2. So I just divide into the cases, well, they, all, they both happen to be at y. Now, I'm in the regular case, right? So the, the basically, p is i plus the adjacency matrix, so it's symmetric, so I can flip. And if I look at this, it's just a probability that I go from x back, to, that I return to x in s1 plus s2 time steps. 
right? I'm just kind of writing this probably in terms of where I am at time s1. Okay, so this is a bound. Uh, but this isn't, well, this is definite, but uh, we also know because we have this no negative spectrum that I can write this in terms of eigenvectors and eigenvalues, right? So this is just, uh, this is just linear algebra. I mean, you just have your eigenvectors. Uh, you know that the first eigenvalue is one. The, the, by first, I mean the largest. And that the first eigenvector, when you square it, you have one over n. So the first term in the sum is one over n. And then I have a bunch of other terms. I mean, the important thing for me is that the lambda i's are all non-negative. And the psi i's, are, well, they're squared, so they're also non-negative, right? So, and then I look at this and I get this quantity Right, I'm summing down from i for i greater than two. And this is certainly no negative. So this is why you have uh, a lower bound for the expected number of intersections. Okay, so far so good. I haven't done really anything special. So let me just say, okay, this is a probability of return. Then I subtract this one over n factor and I get this t squared over n. As we said, this is no negative, right? So this is where the lower bound comes from. And also because it's no negative, I can just take an upper bound here. I'm just gonna say, well, instead of summing over S1 and S2 up to T minus one, I'm just gonna say for each value of S, I have at most S plus one choices here that give me S1 plus S2 equal to S, and I take an upper bound. Again, I'm using the fact that there's no negative, right? Okay, so what do we do with this? So now you need a way to estimate this, and if you remember, this should be something like the relaxation time to the three halves, for whatever reason. So what we're gonna do is just look at the sum, and you have, uh, you have this, uh, I'm gonna write this again in terms of the spectrum, the, the eigenvalues. And the important thing is that all these coefficients, well, they're less than lambda two, because I'm summing from i greater than two. When lambda two is this guy here, one minus the reciprocal of the relaxation time. What I'm gonna say about the sum, I really don't wanna do uh, anything too fancy. I'm gonna say that if I truncate the sum at the relaxation time, then I only lose a constant factor. And basically this comes from this geometric decay, right? So it's saying that if I sum, say from i equals zero, I, sorry, if I sum from s equals zero up to the relaxation time, and then I sum from the relaxation time plus one up to twice the relaxation time, say, the second sum is at most a certain c times the first term, and the c is less than one. That's basically it. I'm saying that, you know, I, I, I divide my sum into chunks of size, the relaxation time, and each one is geometrically smaller than the previous one. So, and then I get up to a constant, so I get, I can just sum up to relaxation time. And now there's this one last step, which is how do I estimate this guy? Now you can go back to this, uh, to say Aldous and Phil, this uh, book that's been in preparation for forever. <laughs> and there's this bound that tells you that this difference is at, decays at most like one over square root of s. And if you plug that in, you get here, well, s divided by square root of s, so you get square root of s, and this is where you get the t rel to the three halves from. Okay, that's, I probably showed you too much, but that's just to give an idea that first we need some general tool to truncate this expansion, and then we need something very specific. I mean, this is of course sharp for paths, right? So in a sense, it's not surprising that our lower bounds come from uh, graphs that they have long paths in them, right? And uh, yeah, so just to, to say, I mean, if you wanna do it, yeah, so that's the end. And we just, right, we just bounded this thing. And now, uh, I mean, if you're gonna do the non-regular case, which I'm gonna be talking about in a second, uh, we're gonna be looking at slightly different bounds for this that work for non-regular graphs. So this is the degree of the vertex x divided by the minimum degree in the graph. And these bounds are new. I mean, we proved them in a, in a separate paper. Right, but let me just go back to the core of the talk. So I hope I have convinced you that this result, I mean, the upper bound, at least the expectation here makes sense. Right, and it, as I said, it has everything to do with the spectrum, though we don't, we don't use much about the spectrum, we just use it that's no negative, and that uh, all eigenvalues except the trivial one are dominated by one minus one over t rel. 
And then, okay, we need this one last thing, which is this decay of the return probability. Okay, what a kind of what's the message of this part of the talk anyway? Is that um, you know collisions are a very natural idea because we understand them very well, but they turn out to give you suboptimal bounds, and these intersections give you. I mean, they use more information about the random walks, right? They they don't look at what happens at time t; they look at what happens at all times up to t, and it turns out that they're good enough to to give optimal bounds for for all values of the relaxation time. Right, so, but of course we want results for non-regular graphs, so I'm gonna go th quickly through them. What, okay, so you, we, you've seen this proof, or this proof sketch for uh, the bound for, uh, for regular graphs of number of intersections, right? If you try to make that work, there is a crucial step in that proof, which is symmetry, right? We you need to flip the GSC matrix. Symmetry doesn't hold for general graphs, but it, something called reversibility, which probably all of you know, holds. And if you want to make that work, it turns out that the crucial thing is to weight the number of intersections by the degree. And the question is, I mean, this is not going to give you the same bound as before. What does it give a bound for? Well, following the same proof, you see that instead of, of getting n, the number of vertices in the denominator, you get 2m, twice the number of edges in the denominator. And here you get the relaxation time divided by d. So now, okay, maybe we want an estimator for a number of vertices, but what we just got is estimated for a number of edges, for the same reason as before. And uh, maybe I'm gonna write it over, like I'm gonna fix this. Just gonna say, if I wanna estimate the number of edges, I need this to be greater than this. So I need um, something, yeah, maybe I'm missing a factor somewhere here. Okay, I know what the end result should be. Yeah, I think there was an error in the previous slide because, uh, oh no, no, that's right, that's correct. So I need this, and then I have this to be equal to 2m, and the variance is gonna be like the expectation squared. So now, I mean, basically by doing a small modification on the previous estimator, I get an estimator for the number of edges. And there is another bound that you can use for these return probabilities. I mean, you just write down the same calculation that was proved by Russell Lyons and Charles Lovais Garand, and, uh, which gives you another upper bound for the same quantity, which now doesn't depend on the number of edges, depends on the number of vertices, but here you get the uniform mixing time raised to five over six. I mean, I'm not telling you what the bound is, but it's some bound of return probabilities that's different from the one, the one over square root of uh, T bound that I showed you before. So this gives you another result on the time complexity for finding the number of edges. And I wanna quickly convince you that this, so you get an upper bound for T, well K is always gonna be a constant in our case, and you get an upper bound for the optimal T, which is like this. And I wanna convince you that this bound is sharp. And uh, okay, this is easy because for regular graphs, this is exactly what we had before, right? M is, time, is D times N up to uh, over two, so this is N. What about this bound? What, how do I get a family of graphs for which this bound is tight? It's again based on this construction of expanders. So now instead, remember that before I subdivided the edges of the expander. Now besides doing that, I'm gonna, I'm, uh, so this is wrong, this should be length, uh, no this is right, sorry. So yeah, the, the kind of the letters don't really match. So this is an expander with k or two k vertices. I subdivide each path, each, ver, uh, each edge into a path of length q, and I replace each vertex uh, with a clique, right? So these edge, I mean, kind of, you know, they're gonna, I'm going to pick three vertices in the clique and connect them to these paths. And how long does it take you to, for you to, to visit square root of k cliques, right? This is where the lower bound comes from. Well, basically you have to, I mean, the, you have to look at the unit cost, say, of crossing an edge in the expander, right? What is it like? Okay, if I, I'm lucky enough to reach a vertex from which I can cross a path, there is still a much higher probability that I can come back, right? And if I come back to the clique, I'm gonna take time on, of the order of q to try to cross again. 
So on average, I need uh, Q squared steps to cross the edge, but I don't need Q attempts to do that. So I slow down by a factor of Q to the cube. I and mean, that requires some thought, but that's basically the idea. You need Q squared time to cross once, but you need lots of attempts to, to actually do it. And so the relaxation time is like Q, Q, uh, Q cubed. And then the time it takes you, again, it's like before, right? The square root of K comes from the expander bound, and Q cubed is this extra factor that you get. And you work it out, and it turns out this gives exactly this number, right? So you can see it, right? So if you put a Q in here, you get Q raised to 5 halves, and that's the relaxation time raised to 5 over 6. So oddly enough, this very kind of weird looking bound is also tight. Right, so let me just uh, say something. Okay, once you can estimate the number of vertices, you can estimate the number of, sorry, if once you can estimate the number of edges, you can estimate the number of vertices by computing the average degree. This you can do in this time, and perhaps I, I don't have time to explain, but there is a, I mean, you really need additional time to estimate the number of vertices. Right. And the time, additional time you need is this thing here. T, well, up to log factors is t and if m divided by n. And there is some example to prove that. And so this is a bound you need for the number of vertices. Let me quickly say that if you want to compute the L2 distance to equilibrium, right? So notion of mixing from the specific vertex x, as we know, we can also relate that to return probabilities. And once you know that, you can also devise an estimator for the mixing time from the same ideas, right? So return probabilities, as we saw, are related to the intersection probabilities of paths. And then uh, if we, we can devise an estimator based on intersections for the mixing time. And uh, okay, so what did we see? We saw that basically by looking at random walk intersections, of, uh, we, we can get uh, optimal estimators for these three parameters, number of vertices, number of edges, and the mixing time from a specific vertex. And, uh, but we also saw there are, there are limitations, right? So, I mean, there are no self-stopping algorithms of this kind that decides on its own when to stop. And they're not gonna be uh, sublinear algorithms in general. You really need a small relaxation time or mixing time for that to, to work. But, of course, there are many open problems, right? Because um, uh, you can ask about other graph parameters. How do you estimate anything else about the graph? We don't really know. And there's some other thing, which is that, okay, somehow the, the way I try to convince you that this is a reasonable model for computation, say, well, it's easy to implement, well, people actually implement random walks in real life, right? So, but the way they do it is basically, I mean, the, the way random walks are nice is that you're using this algorithm where you just explore the graph little by little, and you just need to walk from vertices you've seen to neighbors of those vertices, right? So there's a more general class of algorithms that you could think that's like that. Perhaps you have a set of vertices you have seen and you know their degrees, and you can ask to see uh, a neighbor, uh, a, a, a new vertex at the boundary of the set, perhaps picked at random somehow. The, I talked about that before, as, as I said, the expander lower bound also works for this model, where you just query the graph little by little. But uh, we don't know uh, I mean, so for expanders, in some sense, random walk intersections are optimal, even if you allow for a more general model. But we don't know that that's true for more general things. And actually, our lower bound examples, they're based on the fact that it takes you a long time to cross a path, which is not gonna be true in this model. You can basically just move forward on the path. So what's the right parameter to study this model? I, I venture to guess that it's the Chigo constant, but it's, uh, uh, it's an open problem. So with that, I guess I'll finish, and uh, thank you for your attention. Any questions? example where using some other processes you can uh, have a better uh... um, no so I mean so with, uh, talking to Gabor yesterday we're trying to think of a slightly different question which is uh, is there any family any reasonable family of graphs 
for which uh, there is something better than looking at random walk intersections, right? And uh, there, there's a candidate family that came out of conversation yesterday where we haven't been able to figure it out. But no, I don't have any examples. What we can show is different, right? So we say yeah. random walk intersection give an upper bound, and for kind of any relaxation time, we can give them uh, family of graphs with a matching lower bound. Well, I think that's the ask. Okay. You told me that <laughs> the answer yesterday. <laughs> So non mapping random walk is sometimes better. Right, so it's better, uh, it's, it's better on the examples we built, right? So because we have these paths and you can just walk forward. Uh, we don't know whether it actually gives you an improvement in general, so to speak. Yeah. But yeah, for, I mean, all the lower bounds come to, you know, you take an expander, you subdivide the edges, right? For those examples, clearly if you have something that doesn't go back, you're not gonna have this diffusive effect, right? So, but we don't know whether there are other examples that where kind of you know non-backtracking doesn't help. 